Good afternoon, everyone. We will give a few more minutes so everyone can join us and then we will start with today's session.
once more good afternoon everyone i see most of you are already here and a couple of attendees are still connecting thank you for joining us today hope you all made a nice cup of coffee or a tea and are comfortably seated we were actually hoping that we would be able to organize a live in-person workshop for everyone but unfortunately that is still not an option um, hope, this, hope this changes soon. Um, I'm really excited for today's session. Uh, I'm sure you will get a lot of useful information and what is more important, some advices and best practice examples. This is also a perfect opportunity to speak directly to Altaro team. So in case you have any questions, uh, topics you would like to address or something you would like to share with us in Altaro, please feel free to do so. Um, so that being said, all that is left is to lean back and uh, enjoy today's session. Today I have the honor to welcome you all to our Altaro VM Backup Workshop. We have prepared some really interesting content for you, but before we start, there is just a few housekeeping things we want to share with uh, everybody. All attendees are on mute, but uh, this is a workshop, so please, I encourage you all to unmute yourself and ask any questions you might have. In case you prefer, you can also use the chat box on your right side and uh, write your questions. Uh, we will try to answer them as we go along and if we skip some, we will answer them during our Q&A session at the end. So uh, we hope that the connection is okay, that you can uh, see us and hear us well and uh, this session is uh, recorded and the recording will be shared with you after the workshop. So today we are joined by three important members of uh, Altaro team. Colin Wright is a vice president of uh, EMEA at Altaro Software. Dr. Carsten Hack, who is a uh, EMEA field engineer at Altaro. He will actually lead today's workshop and will introduce himself additionally in a few moments. And of course, uh, Jan Koch, who is a senior channel development manager at Altaro Software. Um, I want to use this opportunity to thank uh, all three of you for making this workshop possible and for joining us, of course, today. Uh, if you have any specific questions for Jörn or Colin, um, I encourage you to use this opportunity. I'm sure they will be happy to answer any questions you might have. So, with uh, that being said, I will uh, hand you over to Dr. Kasten. Just a second. So, Dr. Kasten, I will uh, make you a presenter now. Do you hear me now? Yep, we hear you. Perfectly. Perfect. Good, uh, good afternoon to, to everyone uh, in this call. As my colleague said, um, my name is Carsten Haag. I'm uh, the uh, responsible field engineer uh, for EMEA, for Altaro. And uh, what we wanted to do today is a more or less informal uh, session uh, covering the uh, VM backup uh, product. Um, the, there are no uh, specific plans for this session. Uh, I will go through uh, the standard uh, UI that uh, one or the other might know um, from our product, as you can see, hopefully, on my screen now. Um, this is the um, yeah, newest version of the product uh, as of today. Uh, it's downloadable from our internet site. As you can see, it's 8.24.2.0. Um, as uh, every other product, uh, it could be downloaded uh, from our internet site, could be tried out uh, for 30 days, or could be used for updating uh, existing um, installations. Um, our product, is I think um, very different to any other uh, backup product uh, in the market. Uh, the main difference uh, is that it's uh, kept extremely uncomplicated uh, and it's um, yeah consuming as less time as possible 
uh, working with backup. We all know that uh, in IT, nobody wants to spend uh, more time with backup uh, than anyhow needed. Nobody likes backup. Uh, so uh, it works and it's somewhere uh, on, on a computer, but uh, we don't have to to spend time with it at all. And uh, this is the way our product is designed. And uh, you will see this uh, in the overview uh, today. You just download a 230, 240 uh, megabyte file from the net, um, hit install uh, on a Windows server. And um, within one to two minutes, uh, the product itself is installed without any preparation on these servers. The product itself uh, can be installed and is running on uh, Windows 2012, 2016 and 2019 servers. Um, as this question always is rising up uh, in my video conferences, technically uh, it also works on Windows uh, 2008, but unfortunately uh, Microsoft cancelled support uh, for 2008 in February last year, so uh, you can run it, but uh, as far as Windows is concerned, uh, we cannot uh, give any support anymore. After installing the product, uh, you will uh, be presented with uh, this dashboard, as you can see on my screen now, this dashboard is showing all the um, yeah, or how the uh, product is running at the moment. You get an overview to how much of your storage uh, space is used on each drive. Uh, you get an overview uh, to running processes if, if there are any or about uh, processes in the queue that are scheduled for later operation. You get an overview to the last uh, 50 operations and how they worked and you get an overview to um, how much data has been read and how much data has been written. As you can see here, we've got the deduplication and, um, and compression rate of around 50% compared to the original data. If you want to get more details about what is happening on the system, um, you can get an overview to uh, the last month of operation, so how much uh, data has been backed up. You get an overview uh, uh, on how much data was read and how much data has been written, and you get an overview uh, to all the different um, types of, uh, of operations that uh, have taken place on this machine. After installing uh, that um, software on a Windows server, you will be led through three um, configuration steps uh, automatically. The first configuration step uh, will be to uh, define one or more hypervisor hosts from which uh, the virtual machines should be backed up. So you can add, um, as uh, most of you might know, you can add uh, either Hyper-V uh, hosts or VMware hosts. The Hyper-Vs could be, again, uh, from 2012, 2016 and 2019. Um, the uh, VMware hosts can be of versions 5.0 through 7.0 and uh, can be both uh, ESXi or vCenter. As soon as you have defined uh, and um, uh, logged into the system using system credentials or administrative or root credentials, um, this server will be registered and all the virtual machines of this server will be automatically discovered. Second step will be to define uh, the backup locations. And as you can see, um, you get a tree structure displayed on the left of the screen uh, containing all uh, the virtual machines that have been discovered on all registered uh, hosts. In the middle of the screen, you've got uh, the so-called primary backup location. 
uh, this primary backup location uh, can be either a physical drive, so a drive with a drive letter, um, di directly uh, connected drive, or eSATA, iSCSI, eSAS, or alike. Or it could be a network path using um, the usual um, nomenclature like uh, backslash, backslash, server name, and so forth. Um, you can define as many uh, primary targets as you like. Um, the uh, VMs are attached using drag and drop uh, to these locations. So it's very easy, even for somebody who is working with Windows only since one week, um, this person now should be able to work with our software as well without further uh, introduction. Um, you can, so as a, just... yes. I'm sorry, just to jump in because we have some questions coming in. Yeah, please. And, and I see one is actually fitting to the topic that you're, you know, talking about right now. So, um, when a primary backup location is a network path, is drive swapping supported? Drive swapping uh, or or uh, this? Uh, you mean uh, this drive rotation scheme? Drive rotation, I would guess this means. Uh, drive rotation scheme uh, is only supported for off-site targets. Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah, not not for primary, just for off-site targets. The, and also uh, we. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, now there, there's one more uh, question. It's on the topic of uh, tapes. Can you use tapes for on-site backup? No. Simple answer, no. This uh, And due to um, the way the data is organized and written, um, our software is not uh, developed for using tape at all. We are using um, normal, yeah, let's say file system devices for storing the data. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, as I said, you can uh, define as many uh, backup targets as you like. Every virtual machine has to be linked to a maximum of one um, primary backup location. For the off-site locations, you can also go for physical drives or network paths. You can, in addition, uh, use three different um, uh, cloud environments, which is Microsoft, Amazon, or Wasabi, um, just using your either connection string or your logging credentials. Um, to these environments and the data will be stored uh, in these cloud environments. In addition, you can use uh, an, another Altaro product, which is called the Altaro Offsite Server. The Altaro Offsite Server is a free piece of software that can be downloaded from our internet site as well. Uh, can be down, uh, can be installed uh, to any Windows Server 2012, 2016, and 2019 as well, and uh, can be used uh, as a target for both uh, backups and replicas. So our product is not just able to uh, work as a backup product; it also can. Uh, work in a disaster recovery environment using replicas. Yeah, and as we mentioned, uh, a scheme of drive rotation, so uh, swapping the drive every day uh, is um, supported for uh, or as a um, off-site target. So if you want uh, to run um, drive swapping devices, uh, you have to define them as secondary targets. Um, the VMs are also attached by dragging and dropping them. And uh, in the most uh, versatile version of our software, the Unlimited Plus, as I'm demonstrating it here, uh, the um, VMs uh, can be uh, can be backed up once to a primary target, and a maximum of two times to two different um, backup uh, to two different offsite 
targets, not caring about whether it's a NAS system or uh, a cloud target. The third so, step. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, no, I no, don't you, be. I think you mentioned this already, but we got a question about uh, cloud backup providers. Uh, I'm guessing for offsite backup, which are available. These are, uh, as you can see here, uh, these are Microsoft with Azure, Amazon, and Wasabi. In the next major release, um, as we are now um, a, a company of um, Hornet security, there will be uh, a fourth entry here using the Hornet cloud as well. Okay, thank you. I guess this answered the questions. Uh, the question, if it's uh, not the answer, just please, uh, yeah, clarify the question again. But I think this answers it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry, not reading uh, the questions myself, but they are on uh, the the, the uh, questions are on a very remote screen, so I have to to shake my head every time. <laughs> so I'm really I'm I I. I uh, think it's better that that uh, you read the questions to me yeah no worries i'm keep, keeping an eye on it no okay. um as i said the third step uh you will be led through uh after installation uh will be uh, the definition of backup schedules as you can see here you can add as many uh schedules as you like and you can define uh whether they should run uh on a daily basis, whether uh, there should be only primary backups or off-site backups as well, or uh, whether they should run on a monthly basis on a certain day of the month, uh, and whether there should be off-site copies as well. Again, uh, the machines can be attached to as many schedules uh, as you like, and uh, they are attached using drag and drop as well. Yeah, now uh, we are getting a little bit deeper uh, into the product. The first um, setting here is the CDP, the Continuous Data Protection. The Continuous Data Protection uh, is the way how our product uh, takes snapshots or invokes snapshots. Uh, of the virtual machines before taking backups. Um, the CDP uh, triggers either uh, the VSS functionality of Windows or uh, the snapshot facility of uh, VMware, uh, freezes uh, the state of the machine and takes uh, the backup out of uh, this um, snapshot. So we are not inflicting production in any way. We are always taking the backup out of these snapshots. So you can see here, um, we can uh, take these snapshots every 12 hours down to every five minutes. So uh, these snapshots, uh, which also um, uh, are used for crash consistency of these backups uh, can be very, very actual if you need them. In addition, on the right side uh, of the screen, uh, you can see application consistency in addition to crash consistency. This application consistency is also using the VSS um, functionality of Windows or the snapshot facility of VMware, but now out of the perspective of, uh, of the file system of uh, the hypervisor. So with this, uh, they, um, the hypervisors will freeze their IOs to these machines as well. So if you are running, um, for instance, databases or um, uh, email systems or alike, uh, you can also stop uh, the hypervisor itself uh, from working with these machines uh, at this very moment. Yeah, in times of GDPR, um, we all have to live with uh, retention policies and uh, we have to guarantee that certain data is deleted 
out of the database at a certain time. As you can see here, um, the retention policies can be applied um, um, independently for the uh, primary backups and for the offsite uh, backups. It's very easy to define these. You can um, yeah, enter a certain uh, number of days that uh, these uh, data, these uh, yeah, backups should be kept in the backup database. This could be from one day to uh, 32,768, so merely 100 years. Um, and you can tell the system uh, what to do uh, after this interval expired. So uh, you can um, either delete uh, the uh, data or the copy out of the backup database altogether, or you can push the data out into a grandf grandfather, father, son um, archive. So you can define um, uh, yeah, after which uh, interval um, yeah, uh, a copy should be held uh, in this archive, you can uh, for for um, son uh, you can define it in weeks. For father you can define it in months, and for uh, grandfather you can uh, define it in years. And as I said, it's uh, independently for um, for uh, primary and offsite backups. In the advanced settings, um, you can um, yeah, turn the little wheels in the product. Uh, as you can see here, you can switch on or off uh, deduplication for each individual machine. Uh, we are using a variable blocked uh, deduplication scheme, uh, which compares uh, blocks off, out of the VMs uh, two blocks in the whole, uh, so the complete backup database, which make it, it makes it very efficient uh, to deduplicate the data uh, within the backup. So the more uh, machines of the same type uh, you keep on a hypervisor, uh, the uh, more efficient uh, the deduplication rate uh, will be. Um, the encryption can only be turned on or off for the primary backups. The secondary, so the off-site backups are always encrypted and that can't be switched off. We are using a 256 AES algorithm uh, and the key for this algorithm is held by the customer. So it's very uh, secure uh, to send the data over public lines also. So when we are um, talking about the duplication, uh, uh, the questions are coming in. So is there any reason not to use the duplication? Um, <laughs> this is this is a long lasting argument I have with my development uh, colleagues. Why uh, to give the customer even the chance to switch off the duplication? I don't see any real life situation. Uh, where I should switch that off, this off. I'm really, I, I, I am honest here. I don't know why somebody should switch this off. Maybe, maybe with bigger machines, with higher change rates um, on slow uh, machines or on slow uh, uh, hypervisors, maybe um, you could get uh, a performance gain by not using deduplication. But you will see this performance gain only uh, with the first and initial backup because all the data of that machine is touched during uh, that backup process. With using CBT, which is the change to block tracking, this is our way how to do incremental backups. And uh, starting with the second backup, we will only uh, look into a list which is kept by this uh, CBT functionality. And this list is keeping uh, the blocks, technically we are talking about cylinders here, uh, which have been written into 
on these virtual machines. So uh, we don't have to compare the current state uh, of virtual machines to the last backup state. We just go through the CBT list uh, and uh, take these cylinders, we uh, deduplicate them, compress them, and send them into the backup database. It might be, as I said, it might be a small, a very, very small, insignificant performance gain switching off the deduplication on very slow machines. In other cases, I don't see any need to switch off deduplication at all, to be very honest. I think that answers the question. <laughs> yeah. I, I know it's always a long answer, but uh, it's it's based on my experience. I would say um, machines which are so slow that uh, you will see a really good performance boost with not using deduplication are so old now that they are taken out of production. Yeah, out of my perspective. Also, um, there is a, a question for Hyper-V replica or Altaro replication uh, benefits and differences. Yeah, the uh, the uh, replica of Hyper-V uh, is always transporting the complete machine at a time. So uh, you are always reading out the complete VM and uh, the system is storing the complete VM uh, to a secondary server. So it will take uh, much more time and it will take uh, much more uh, yeah, bandwidth uh, to do so. Uh, with our replication, uh, we are using the deduplication and compression mechanism as well. So um, we are copying over uh, the complete virtual machine um, when creating the first replica. With every following um, update of the replica, which is, by the way, uh, every time uh, taken when, the, um, when this interval is running out, or uh, when a primary backup is taken. So these are the two triggers which initiate updating the replicas. Um, with working with our replicas, we are just using uh, the change block tracking as well. So we are just transporting uh, the compressed and deduplicated data that has been changed uh, on the machine. Now, this is this is the difference. The handling, if you ask me, the handling is as easy on Hyper-V as it is in our machine. Okay, uh, since you're already here, it's a perfect chance to ask the question in regards to CDP. What is the smallest interval you can set up and how do you actually, what is some kind of recommended way to define the best interval for a specific customer? Yeah, oh, <laughs> that's uh, the the holy grail of uh, questions being answered. Uh, I, I would pay real money if there would be an algorithm uh, to to have around here. But um, working with these intervals is very very individual to each virtual machine. Um, it could happen that or in in most cases i would say 75 to 90 percent of the cases um, our software will not take longer than half a minute maybe a minute um, to to uh, update uh, the backup data and the replica in a normal environment normal environment I'm talking about, let's say, 50 to 100 gigs of uh, virtual drives and let's say 10 to 15 percent change rate over the day. This would be a normal environment. Um, 
it also depends on the type of um, uh, applications that are run in uh, the virtual machine. So if you have large virtual machines talking about, I don't know, 500 gig, one tera or larger, uh, and running, let's say, um, yeah, email systems or uh, databases in there with high change rates between 30 and 50% a day, it could happen. And in addition, depending on the hardware you are using, are you using spinning drives? Uh, which bandwidth does your network have? Which overall performance does the, uh, the hypervisor server uh, provide and so forth? Um, it could happen that getting down to five minutes gets you into, into a situation where this uh, system is uh, beginning to write down that it's writing down something. Yeah, it could happen, what I want to say, it could happen that this interval of five minutes might not be enough uh, to read out, uh, decompress, or uh, I'm sorry, um, deduplicate, compress, transport, and write down uh, the changes. This is why I say it is a very, very individual matter that every user really has to, to uh, test on every um, individual virtual machine, at least for one time, uh, to be sure that this interval that is used here is not getting the machine into a constantly writing um, state. This could happen. Yeah, but uh, this is something everyone uh, working with databases or email systems or alike uh, can fathom uh, because they know their systems best uh, and they know uh, for which interval to go to because um, you always have to to choose an interval that is larger uh, than the average time that our system takes uh, to take an incremental backup. So I'm and guessing it's better to just choose a, a higher interval and then slowly reduce the you interval can look and yeah. You can look at this uh, operational history listing here, where you get a good overview for each individual um, uh, virtual machine, how long uh, the incremental backup took. Yeah, as you can see here, we've got some seconds, and in other systems, uh, we've got minutes. And this would be a candidate where I have to go uh, up to 10, 15 minutes because I cannot be sure that five minutes will be enough uh, for this machine to finish its incremental backup. Yeah, as uh, it has to transport 2.8 gigabytes um, in comparison uh, to 176 bytes for this machine, for instance. Yeah, it always depends on the change rate of the machine and on the size of the machine. But you can get an overview to how long these processes take uh, in this list here, and you can um, yeah make your decisions uh, based on um, this uh, uh, duration settings here or duration uh, values. Okay, um, I'm guessing this uh, answers the question. We have one that's a little bit uh, maybe easier than the uh, previous <laughs> one. So uh, it, it's basically the same like uh, with uh, the duplication. So CBT, um, mm -hmm. is there any reason why you shouldn't uh, use CBT? Um, the yeah, only maybe. reason would be if you, uh, there is, as you saw, there is, um, ah, wrong glasses, advanced settings. Um, 
as you see, there uh, are there is uh, a tick box for uh, switching off CBT for every machine. The only um, time one should want to switch this off is to produce a complete new full backup. So if you want to produce a complete new full backup, for which reason ever, you just switch off CBT and the next time a backup is taken, the backup will not be deduplicated uh, against uh, the existing backup database. It will be a full backup, uh, including all um, blocks, not just the changed ones. Okay, that for sure answers the questions. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, besides uh, the retention uh, policies, it could always happen that uh, somebody out of legal, out of personal, out of uh, which department ever asks you to get rid of uh, certain versions of the backups. You can do this here. You can uh, choose any backup that uh, is residing in the backup database, both uh, locally and offsite. Uh, and delete uh, this backup manually. One hint, as we are in uh, tips and tricks, one hint, um, the best hidden functionality in our system is this underlined sentence here. Click here to run the optimization tool. I don't know why there is not a tick box here in the menu as well. Uh, this is uh, the um, functionality which gives you back unused storage space uh, on both the uh, primary and offsite targets. Um, and you not just can take uh, storage space back if you deleted certain um, backup entries but also if you are using the retention policies, because the retention policies um, delete um, backup entries logically, but it can happen that uh, these entries are needed physically uh, to represent a certain block uh, that other blocks need or used uh, to be deduplicated. So they are not readable anymore, but they still reside in the backup database and con consume space. So uh, my tip would be um, to use this optimization tool, let's say every month or every two months against all of your uh, backup volumes to gain uh, space back. What this tool does uh, is it goes through the whole backup database, compares all the blocks uh, and uh, the vectors, the deduplication vectors to these blocks, rearranges the uh, backup database and gives the not longer needed space back to the file system. And um, yeah, depending on the size of your backup database, uh, you can gain back 5, 10, up to 50 or 100 gigabytes by just using uh, this optimization tool. Okay. But, and now I have to raise my index finger, um, you should not run this on a normal working day because uh, this optimization tool is setting the complete software in the so-called maintenance mode. The maintenance mode um, yeah, keeps away uh, all other functions uh, from uh, the backup engine and sends all uh, other um, jobs like backups, like offsites, and so forth, into the queue and makes them waiting for until this backup maintenance mode is off. 
So uh, maybe it would be a good idea to run this on Saturday evenings, Monday morning, uh, Sunday mornings or something like, so not during um, initial production. Okay, but this is where to find it. And uh, I don't know why, why it's only in the text here, but uh, this is um, what can, can give you back really physical storage space. Yeah, the notifications um, can be set as in any other um, backup system as well. You just uh, tell the system when uh, to send out a status email report and about which um, functionalities of the system you want to get informed about. Um, the rest is trivial, so you, you enter the SMTP server address um, you uh, enter a username and the password and so forth. So just to re to arrange um, the um, email functionality. The contents of uh, the, this email will um, look like this. So uh, as we saw before, this is a list of uh, yeah of jobs. Uh, that ran uh, in the system, you get a list of uh, when a job uh, occurred uh, from which uh, or uh, what was done here from which hypervisor, which virtual machine, uh, how long this process took. Sorry, how long this process took and how much data was read and how much data has been written. But um, as in all uh, cases in operations, I, I'm not interested in uh, what worked. I'm only interested in what didn't work. And for this, I get a dedicated uh, error history, which only lists the warnings and the errors uh, in the system here. And as you can see, there are two different types. There are only warnings. So um, this is telling you that uh, it worked, but mm, something went wrong. And uh, there are errors uh, containing um, something that didn't work at all. If you want to know uh, what didn't work at all, you just click on this line, you get a dedicated uh, error notif notification. And the best thing here is you just have to hit uh, the live chat button. And with this live chat button, you open a chat window uh, to my colleagues uh, in support. Uh, these colleagues will be provided with all the contents of the error notification, um, meaning that, um, yeah, you don't have to uh, take screenshots or, or um, do copy and paste or alike, and uh, can start uh, the, uh, the chat right away. Yeah, the backups, the backup functionality is also trivial. Uh, trivial. You just uh, mark one or more of these machines and hit take backup, or you wait until uh, the um, next scheduled process will kick off. Same for uh, the offsite copies. Uh, you mark one or more of these machines and hit take offsite copy. What you can do for for instance, for the uh, initial backups, um, you can um, mark all these machines and tell the system to write the data uh, to a mobile storage device attached to your server. So you can uh, write this data um, to a disk, transport it over to the remote server, uh, and import it there without stressing the network, if you don't want to stress the network bandwidth for, for instance, the initial backups. Yeah, the replication um, is also uh, very easily um, uh, maintained. So you can, uh, as I said, you have to install uh, the Altaro offsite server, which uh, is used as a off-site target uh, for this server. And uh, as soon as you have installed this AOS as a backup target, uh, you will have the chance to um, enable replication for 
um, for a certain VM or for certain VMs, just hit enable uh, replication and uh, this functionality will be switched on uh, for these certain machines. And from then on, one copy is done automatically. So when you switch on uh, the replication, the first initial full copy uh, is uh, initiated automatically. Um, all other uh, updates to this machine, as I said, will uh, either be taken with every full backup or uh, yeah, with every backup uh, of the machine. So out of the scheduling settings or um, every time the CDP interval is running out. So we have a question here uh, yes. in regards to replication. Um, when using replication with ESXi host, what is the proposed solution for offsite server and how to best set it up? Um, this is very easily set up for, um, um, for Hyper-V. The machines are placed directly on the AOS server since we are uh, or we need uh, a Windows server to be the target. Um, this um, Hyper-V server or Windows server um, when you're running ESXi will be used as a pass-through system. Um, so uh, on this ESXi server or on the Hyper-V server, sorry, um, uh, in the settings of uh, the offsite server, I now switch to the offsite server window here. Um, you have to configure a certain account uh, to log in and you have to define uh, target hosts. And with these target hosts, this one is uh, the local Hyper-V host. This one uh, will be an ESXi host that these machines will be forwarded to. Since we cannot start um, uh, ESX or, or uh, VMware um, um, machines in general on a Hyper-V, we have to forward them uh, to an ESXi or vCenter host. And uh, when we are getting uh, to start the replication, when we are hitting uh, boot replicated VM, uh, for VMware servers, they will be started on, on the AOS machine directly. For ESXi or for vCenter, they will be started on that dedicated VMware that we defined in the target hosts. Okay, I guess this answers the question. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we will get back to uh, the VM backup installation for um, the restore of the machines, we can go uh, and restore complete clones and the restore. Uh, one, one special thing here is that we uh, not only can restore a certain machine um, to the Hyper-V host or to the ESXi host uh, they are coming from, we also can restore them to uh, any hypervisor in the network that is running the same version of software. So um, if you don't want, maybe in the case, you don't want to restore uh, this BSD image, uh, not to uh, Hyper-V, but to any other, um, um, win, in my case here, Windows 2019 uh, hypervisor, um, you just enter the network address or the WinS or DNS name uh, into this um, into this uh, line here, and the machine uh, will be um, uh, yeah restored uh, to that Windows server. So you can move around um, these machines as well. You can do the same for. Uh, you can do the same for uh, restoring single virtual disks, so you can move them around uh, between servers as well. 
um, for Windows systems or for Windows VMs uh, running FAT32 and uh, NTFS, you can granularly uh, get back files as well. So you will get uh, displayed um, a um, yeah the the entries of the file system of the Windows virtual machine and can restore uh, single files from there either to another virtual machine or to uh, a server in the network or to another network location. With uh, local VMs running uh, Exchange, uh, you can go down into the Exchange database and restore single, uh, yeah, single mail entries or single attachments from that uh, mail entry. If you don't want to use a second server um, for installing the AOS and uh, then running um, yeah, replicas against that server. You can also use the functionality to boot machines directly out of the backup. So you don't have to attach them to a certain Hyper-V. You don't have to, to go to the Hyper-V manager and start them. You just start them out of this uh, interface here. Just show you. Let's say we take any machine that is in here. Let's say this Debian one here. Yeah, we choose the uh, version of the backup. We give it a certain name and we can move it around in the network as well. So if there were uh, any other servers you were running 2019 Hyper-V, you can uh, boot them to these servers as well. And by just hitting boot, you will see uh, that uh, this machine now starts to collect the data out of the backup database. And uh, going to this uh, Hyper-V manager here, we will see that in a few seconds, uh, a copy or a clone of this um, Debian server uh, will appear in this list and we can use uh, this machine immediately. Here we go. So these are the, the two ways how to handle um, yeah, broke down machines. You can either start di directly out of the backup or use uh, the Altaro offsite server and start um, the um, systems from there. So as you can see, it takes not half a minute uh, to boot these machines directly out of the backup if you need it. So there is um, one question that actually yes. I think you answered by this short demo, which is uh, how long will the server be down for joining data if boot from backup is done? Down? Uh, done. So oh. how long will the server be down? For it's joining always data. No, not not down. It's uh, but it's it's done as you can see, depending on the size of the machine. Uh, so these are demo machines. These are uh, in a size between uh, 50 and 75 gigs. Um, it always depends on um, yeah the hardware of the system we are booting that machine against. Um, it depends on whether we are using SSDs or uh, standard rotating disks. Um, it depends on whether we are starting out of a backup in the network or directly uh, connected to um, to the server itself and so forth. So, so you can uh, say it can take 10 seconds. It could be a minute or two. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, yeah, and these were the um, standard functionalities of the product. You can, uh, in addition, use uh, the testing and verification um, functionalities here, which I see I have to do after this demo. I don't know where these warnings are coming from, but uh, it seems my day is saved by <laughs> working on this. So 
Um, you can uh, both uh, use a um, only scanning mode. So these uh, verification uh, will look through the backup database and make sure that all the data is readable and could be used for restoring machines. Or you can go for um, complete test restores meaning that all the machines uh, will be restored to a certain hypervisor, so to Hyper-V or to uh, ESXi or VMware, and will be started up. Again, I have to raise my index finger, uh, meaning that uh, there has to be enough disk space to bring back all these machines physically, and meaning that there is enough uh, main memory on these machines to start up all the machines at once. Okay. I have seen cases where uh, this has not been taken into consideration. Um, if you don't want to do it manually, you can uh, set a scheduler for this as well. So uh, you can tell the system uh, either to um, either to uh, go through um, a manual or just a verification uh, process or to restore uh, the machines as well. Um, fortunately, my colleagues uh, entered this automatically delete checkbox here so that you don't have to take care of getting rid of the machines afterwards. The backup health monitor itself is running automatically as long as you are uh, using the uh, CDP functionality. So as long as CDP is switched on for at least one machine, this backup health monitor is running automatically. If you don't have um, CDP switched on, you can uh, switch it on here manually and you can tell the system uh, to check for uh, yeah a certain amount of days within uh, the backup versions and uh, make sure that uh, no issues have been detected like this. Or you will be reminded that you have been lazy and you have to, to do this yourself um, at a certain time. Yeah, these were all the functionalities of um, VM backup. Okay, so um, if you want, we can now jump to our Q&A session because we are close to one hour mark. Um, oh. <laughs> there, there were some um, questions that we skipped. We can maybe address them now mm -hmm. if you, okay. So I will leave uh, your screen sharing uh, active just in case maybe you want mm -hmm. to also show something. Um, so let's check. Uh, there was one question that we skipped actually at the beginning, but you um, answer it if I'm not mistaken. So are there any plans on adding more cloud backup providers? So if I remember correctly, you said uh, there will be Hornet uh, backup uh, location added to Wasabi and uh, Azure. That's correct. Uh, this will be, um, yeah, uh, in the next major release um, when we, when we, uh, I, I think it, uh, the beta will be out for testing in two, two or three weeks. And uh, are we talking about uh, several location within EU? Are we talking about Germany, where uh, which with, is actually? With, uh, with uh, Hornet, we are talking about, I think, four or five locations within the EU. We are talking UK, we are talking US, and we are talking uh, Asia US. Pacific. Ah, okay. And this can be uh, can be um, uh, set uh, when opening the account. Okay, so then there is a next uh, question, um, which is, I would guess, more of a statement. Statement. I'm guessing we are searching for confirmation from you. I will just read it as it is. So the configuration is saved in the configuration in the config backup folder. So I'm guessing the yes. configuration of the backup. Um, 
in the configure backup location. For first install, it backups at 1 a.m., not immediately after taking backup. At least that's what I'm told. So is that correct? Is that hard coded? So I'm guessing the question it is, is it here. Is doing, it yeah. is doing what? I'm guessing the question here is that uh, with the initial backup, when you configure your backup, the config backup is not uh, automatically uh, saved to this location, but it's rather saved the first time at 1 a.m. in the morning. And this seems to be an uh, answer that a customer partner got from Altaro support team. That's interesting. I never heard this. No, uh, it okay. normally it starts it starts right away uh, after after being triggered by the timer. Okay, so technically I have never first... heard I have never heard of anything uh, like like yeah. a. It seems based on this statement that uh, backup of configuration is delayed uh, rather than started right away with the backup itself. Uh, the backup of the config ah i'm sorry the backup of the configuration can exactly. only be done uh as uh, in in uh a short period of maintenance mode so um it will always wait until uh the last backup is uh is uh handled over to the queue and then start the backup of the configuration so it can okay. be. I don't know how. I don't know how many VMs are are to be backed up there, but it can happen that this takes. I don't know, uh, ten to fifteen minutes. Okay, so it's not something that is hard coded. It actually no. depends on the amount of the data you have to. It depends actually. on the configuration of the system. Yes, hmm. and on okay, the number so... of of backups that has to be uh, has to be taken uh, before. Uh, taking the uh, backup of the system. Okay, so uh, another question. Uh, Wins, uh, Windows Server 2008 and file granular restore is possible or not? Um, technically, one of yes. Our, technically, yes. So one of our, I will just uh, <laughs> read the whole question. One of our client has problem with some old server. He's unable to restore files from the backup only full restore of a virtual machine. Are they using ReFS for any chance? Um, well, I'm guessing this is something we can ask. So, Tony, please, if you can just clarify the question and answer additionally, we will be happy to. Because uh, an NTF, NTFS and FAT32 uh, did not change in definition since 2008. So no, um, no, they are not using VSS. NTS, then, NTFS. Then we have to then we have to look at the configuration itself. Uh, it could uh, happen that that um, the um, locally installed .NET version is not 472. Um, this is the first thing they have to check. Uh, if they don't have 472 installed, uh, this is the first thing I would go for. Uh, download 472 um, uh, and install it on that system. If that does not help, uh, the audience has got my email address, uh, I think, on the slides um, of your session, or we'll get them, uh, I don't know, afterwards. We can, we can also the, drop drop it in a chat or we can share it afterwards yeah yeah just drop me an email uh and and uh, yeah if if you should need any more help or have any uh, additional inquiries i will be happy to help okay so uh dynamic partitions uh, in vm are not supported when using a file restore um in near future would this be changed um, this has been yes the work on this uh has been postponed because uh 
after uh, the acquisition by uh, Hornet Security, uh, some other uh, features have been uh, prioritized before that. I know that uh, my colleagues are working on this. Uh, I'm not informed about uh, the uh, availability in the product. Um, not in the next, uh, because I've got the feature list here. Uh, but as it's in development, I can only tell you that it will be in one of the next releases. Okay, thank you for this. Uh, so the next one, uh, regarding the instant boot, uh, which are performance requirements or recommendations in general to ensure quick boot performance? No. <laughs> It's like in in um, in Germany we always say uh, much helps much. Um, so it's it's yeah the faster the processor is is it helps to to uh, reduplicate the data and uh, uh, explode the data. Um, the faster the media is, the faster the boot will be. Uh, if I should. Um, do a comparison, um, this will be five to ten times faster on SSDs than on rotating media. Just just a thumb value. Uh, okay, thank you. Then we have another question that's based, uh, focused on data protection. How to protect the backup location from ransomware attacks in case of uh, hypervisor compromise. Somebody who received the Veeam adverts lately, right? Um, as all other products, not just the one I mentioned 10 seconds ago, there will be external measures needed to protect even uh, the products telling customers that they have integrated solutions. They don't. They don't, do have um, yeah, more like uh, more, more or less um, um, gateway solutions based on Linux or alike. If you ask me, and I'm a very, very old and very traditional guy uh, when I'm talking about IT, um, I would take a complete different approach. The approach I would take is to use uh, the RESTful API that comes with our product and to use um, PowerShell on Windows um, to instruct either the uh, networking devices or the storage devices themselves to con disconnect themselves from the network when not needed. The only, three times underlined, the only protection against this type of software is to take the data completely off the net. You can do it either by switching the device off powerly or you can do it by uh, changing the routing tables in the network. Taking this uh, device away from the network when it's not needed and when the backups are sleeping on there. This is the only way how to protect it. As long as the uh, backup targets are residing in a network and can be touched from somewhere in the network, they cannot be safe. Even against all everything that all others are telling you, they can't protect you against anything as long as these volumes are uh, attachable from the network. This okay. was my preach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so let's check. Uh, 
So next one, what license is needed for Altaro replication uh, on primary site and on secondary site? Um, so van optimized replication is available. I think I can um, take this one. One mm -hmm. optimized replication is available in unlimited plus edition. So if you want to have one optimized replication, you will have to go with uh, unlimited plus version of Altaro. But please uh, keep in mind that uh, we have two uh, different ways of licensing the product. Depends on the customer needs. You can either choose to go with option licensing by host, number of hosts, or by the number of VMs that the customer has. So it really depends uh, on, a, on a customer, on a specific case, which licensing option is uh, better for you. Okay, so let's check further. There is, I think, one more question. So um, this will be uh, also a little bit maybe um, complicated, uh, but okay. So dedicated machine for Altaro VM backup is recommended but when it is installed within VM on ESXi server and that server fails, how can the VM be restored as soon as possible and Altaro configuration too? Offsite backup exists, but no Altaro offsite server is installed. Um, the, best, the best uh -huh. way to do it, we've got um, a little tool. If you go to help.altaro.com, you can find it very easily in in um, in the knowledge base how to use it. Uh, we've got a, a little tool um, installed uh, with the product, uh, which you can use to export the configuration of the backup server. So if you have done your your configuration completely. Um, and uh, if you if you are uh, fine with running it, let's say uh, for testing one two three days, uh, then you can uh, export uh, the settings of this uh, backup server. This is a simple text file which is importable by any other um, Altaro VM backup installation. So even if you lose the primary backup server and uh, the um, any any other server that is surrounding uh, this. Um, at the moment, when or or uh, as long as you do have one uh, offsite um, target left, you can always uh, install uh, the uh, VM backup server on another system, import the settings which include. Uh, the versions and the times of the last backups and bring them back. So um, save the configuration by exporting it uh, to a file, save uh, that file on another server and yeah, um, hold it there until it's needed. Okay, thank you. So, um... This is at the moment the last question from the list, but I think something is coming more. Um, let me use this opportunity just these few seconds as we're waiting for the question um, to give you some more useful information. Um, before we close today's session, I just want to turn your attention to all useful resources that are available for you. Um, you will find a lot of useful information and content on our web pages. Um, I encourage you to join and uh, check Altara blogs and forum. Uh, you will find a lot of useful information uh, there as well. In case you need educational materials, um, you can uh, use ebooks or white papers on Altara pages. You can register for webinars and find interesting sessions. You can join uh, both on Altaro and the uh, Nestec website, of course. Uh, in case you need any help with demos, testing, or tech support, you can always contact us uh, via phone or email, or reach out to Altaro Outstanding 24/7 uh, support. We will uh, share 
the contact for from Dr. Carsten uh, with you as well. So as um, Dr. Carsten said, in case you have any questions or something you would like to address or need help some, with something, please don't hesitate to um, contact him. Uh, so let me just take a last check on our questions to see if we received something new. Mm, nope, nope. I think that is it for today. So, Dr. Kasten, is there anything else you would like to address or mention for today's session? Not, not at the moment. Uh, just that uh, if anyone has any inquiry about any functionality of our products uh, after this call, um, just write me an email and uh, yeah, we'll take care of it. Great, amazing. So thank you, Dr. Kasten, for this amazing session today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I wish you all a nice afternoon and hope we see us soon. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Carsten. Thank you all for joining. Have a, have a nice day. Bye.